Welcome, everybody. This is Darren Klum from Tech Talks. And in this week's episode, we have a treat. How many times do we get to hear from a secret agent? That's what you are. That's what you are, Scott. You are a secret agent. (laughs) Um, But we have uh, Scott Larson with us today. And Scott Larson is a friend, uh, an amazing uh, security innovator, pioneer. And I'm going to just call you, I'm going to come right out and say this. You're an icon. And uh, but you were the former uh, FBI cybercrime chief, a supervisory special agent, which, mm-hmm. by the way, when you were young and first starting out in your career, this just had to absolutely get you dates like crazy. So, you know, <laughs> I'm a special Very agent. Nice. <laughs> and uh, but you're also an adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota, which I'm a gopher. And uh, you also uh, do the same with Metro State and. Uh, and you now are CEO and CISO for your own company, which you are crazy enough to be an entrepreneur, which is what I love about you. Uh, but you have Larson Security, so we're going to be talking about uh, a little bit about that. So thank you for being here. I know you could be with a lot of companies trying to be protecting them right now, but you're here with us. So that means yeah. a lot. It's my pleasure, Darren. Look forward yeah. to it. Yeah. So I was trying to figure out how we first met and I was kind of going, well, you know, we have a lot of friends in common and I realized that what, how I think we first met is, um, we have a mutual friend who's one of my investors and he said, you know, I got this guy, he's a former FBI guy. You got to meet him. And I think that's how we, is that how we met? I think that's how we met. Is that it? I think, yeah, I think we had coffee and we started talking technology and in particular security, cybersecurity, and yep. we just hit it off. We just kept talking. About, well, you spoke yeah. my language, right? Yeah. Like, you know, we can start talking about, well, let's talk about DDoS attacks. Oh, cool. You know what that is? You know what, yep. really what a DDoS attack is? Um, but anyway, but I, I think what's so cool is I've learned about you through the years and in, in your career is you you really are somebody... Well, I think I first have to say thank you because it's because of guys like you that our country is safe. And, you know, you've been a a crime fighter and a person with incredible integrity. And I think that, you know, we are are hearing a lot about the FBI these days because of our political season and all the stuff that's been going on. And um, but I think one thing that should make people happy is that there are a lot of really good people like you in the FBI. And so we do want to acknowledge right away on this show that we love our people in the agencies with three letter words. Um, but, uh, but tell us how you got started. I just love to hear your journey and I know our listeners would love to hear that too. Sure. So how do you, you get know, into this? How did I, you know, it, it was very interesting. I was, you know, I'm a Minnesota born and raised, went to school here. And when I was in fifth grade, a, a local FBI agent came and spoke to our elementary school Um. So that was in in fifth grade, and I was intrigued then, but I wasn't like, you know, I knew that was my calling. I I didn't have that, but I thought, God, that's cool. That's fun. Um, It turned out that person was my uh, JV hockey coach. uh, Really? His brother. And then as I went through, I went to St. Thomas here and then uh, had a business degree in in, uh, accounting. I almost minored in computer science. But I went the accounting route, which was very helpful in getting to the FBI. But I ended up talking to the the guy's name is John Otto, and he was actually the acting director in between William Webster and and William Sessions. So really, uh, wow, yeah, and it just was you know an amazing talk, and it kind of got me really interested in the FBI, and ended up applying, and that's how I got at first into the FBI. And that was during the savings and loan crisis of the late 80s. Oh, sure. When the banks were going down, and so you had to follow the money. And yep. the accounting, you know, is very important, and it's very good for investigations. And it's also yeah. great for cybersecurity. No, oh, that's true. That's really true. Isn't that kind of funny how, like, you would never think that your, your entree into fighting bad guys in the cyber world would have been accounting? <laughs> but, but that's kind of, it makes sense, though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And and I, you know, at, at St. Thomas, we learned Lotus 1, 2, 3. Sure. And kind yep. of the early spreadsheet things and other nasty things as well that I kind of flushed from my memory, like Pascal um, and other oh, languages. Oh, yeah, we all but, did. Um, <laughs> um, you know, 
so I, I and then when I got out into the real world for a little bit, I was creating spreadsheets and little programs for you know cost accounting and for inventory, and it was really helpful. And I so I had that skill as I went into the FBI, and then once I was in the FBI, um, I you. I went to uh, Chicago out of, you know, you know we, we trained oh, at FBI yep. Academy in Quantico. That's right. Yep. My first office was Chicago and, and you rotate around. I find, and I ended up on a white collar crime squad that also had computer crime. So we got a call one day. We got a call one day for a computer crime case and kind of the old cigar chompers just looked at me and said, kid, you know, computers, <laughs> this is for you. you know, Cause they didn't know computers. Yep. And that's really how I started. Um, wow. was getting that case. I had to wait a year for my evidence. And so I wanted to learn how to do computer forensics and computer investigations. So I was one of the first 13 agents trained in the FBI uh, in computer forensics by the FBI laboratory. That is just fascinating. So, so literally just that critical um, ability you had to analyze financials really is kind of what led, I mean, that it seems like a logical um, progression because, you know, you're kind of going from, you know, how do you forensically find things within mathematics and spreadsheets to now how do you, you know, maybe find crimes within, you know, data, right? Exactly. And then in Chicago, um, you know, you had the financial network there or industry, you had uh, you know, a lot of the major banks were there for Chicago, who's since been gobbled up. Oh, you know, sure. Board of, board of Trade, um, you know, and there's various hedge funds. And some of the some of my early cases were with one of the quantitative funds that did all the all the quant work on how to trade electronically. So it was really cutting edge. Um, Interesting. You, you had Bell Labs. And, sure, and really my, that's right. I, I cut my teeth on hacking of the phone company. So... <laughs> um, you know, kind of in, in the 90s, early 90s in particular, that, that is where the computers were. They yeah, were that's there, right. They Everything were, was networked. Were, yep. Or some of the big universities and then also the national labs. And they were all there. Northwestern University, University of Chicago, Argonne National Lab, Fermi Lab. So there's all kind of, you know, it was just a great place for me to, to kind of work computer crime and learn the trade. That's, that's fascinating. So now what, what did this experience teach you about cyber criminals because it's probably not what people think you know when people think of cyber criminals they think of some guy in a black hoodie with a you know a zip hoodie you know at three in the morning drinking coca-cola in the basement um but that's not that's not what it is and so what what would what did that experience teach you you know that's a fascinating question uh because it, it, it probably you know matured over time because at first we would say we were working the junior varsity so we could play against the varsity, meaning a lot of the younger computer hacker types were truly in, in the early days exploring. They were going through the networks. You know, they wanted to see what was there. The Internet was just coming around. There was bulletin board systems that were, were hooked up by the phone lines, and that's how they traded all their messages. Uh, but it really comes down to human behavior. Uh, even on the cyber, and I always try to have a human element into cyber crime and cyber criminals because it comes down to what their motivations are. So some people can have a little bit of a god complex and, and you know yep. want to take something down, but a lot of people it turns sooner or later into some sort of profit or some sort of motivation that brings them to do it. Um, and, and as it evolved over time, we saw. The, the hacker groups were actually little criminal syndicates that would would try to try to you know extort our businesses. So in particular, as it as it morphed from the U.S. to Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, that's when we really saw the the organized crime start taking over, where you had people who uh, were hackers. They were working with criminal elements who would then try to get the information, and then they would try to scam. And, and get information, whether it's credit card fraud or they would extort a company, uh, you know, much like it is happening at times today uh, in the new form of ransomware. But I worked at kind of before it was ransomware when they would call from around the world and claim 
that they were a computer consultant and that they would help the company. And then they would work to get their extortion, their bribe payment. So Interesting. So, so, so would you, would you say that as you've seen cybercrime evolve over the years, now you obviously have the tools, which is technology, which, you know, I think we would both uh, agree has, has morphed and changed and, and we have some real issues right now. Um, but would it be fair to say that a lot of the ability to track a cyber criminal would really be around just following the money? I mean, would that really be the best? Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, that's the defense, right? I mean, it's just, you know, it's going to equate to money at some point, right? You're going to have to sell data. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to do something and it's driven largely by money most times. Um wouldn't that be fair to say that, that you follow the money, you you probably have a better you know way of getting to somebody? Absolutely, I, I think um, you know, and, and this goes you know you know through my history of of working these cases. Once somebody needs to get a wire transfer, they need to go to Western Union, they need to go to an ATM, whatever they need to do. There's the the cyber world, you know, the ether has to get to bricks and mortar, and and that's when you right. really find. You know, right, right. Um, now, you were in some really high profile cases, and I know, you know, just because of confidentiality and, you know, different things, you can't really talk about those things. But how did you handle that stress? Because I, for me, I couldn't imagine when you're about to take down some guy who is, you know, a leader of a large corporation or, you know, some crime syndicate with some very you know, nasty ties to some really bad guys. Did you ever just stay awake at night laying in bed going, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, and I don't think yeah, people yeah. understand that stress. That's, yeah, that's no, like a lot of stress. No, no, there is a lot of stress, especially when you're dealing with people's lives at stake. Yeah. Uh, in the cyber terrorism world, the espionage, you know, I worked on Robert Hansen who was an FBI agent spy. That, that not even the FBI and nor the KGB knew who he was. Um, wow. wow. You know, so, so there's all sorts of, of different stresses there. One thing that helps in that is you're part of a team. And, sure. and I recommend That's right. in, in all cybersecurity that you have some team members, a, a, a network, a partner, so you can, you can you know, work together because you need many different skills. That's, um, that's so true. And so you true. Need somebody, you need somebody there also uh, throwing out other ideas, counter theories and, and the like. So you just need that overall. So when you go and, and arrest somebody, you have a team with you. And that is probably the best part of a group like the FBI. You know, I ended up running a squad in Washington, D.C. in Tyson's Corner, and these agents were exceptional. And yeah, we really it, had fun working all sorts of crimes from financial, you know, credit card type to banking to terrorism to, you know, the FISA process when you talk about Russian hacking in the government. So we did the whole at the time because it was still a budding discipline. We did everything. And that was very fun. Right. And so now let me ask you this. I mean, you hear so much negative these days about the FBI. And does it does it bother you when you know how much you guys have sacrificed um, to protect this country and the people in it? Um, does it bother you to see some of the things coming out? And because and I just it's like, you know, I just sit here. There's a part of me that just goes, you know, these people sa sacrifice so much of their lives and just training and the stress and the stuff that you do. And then you maybe have, you know, like in anything in life, you're going to have some good people and you're going to have some bad people. And, you know, you get a couple bad people, bad eggs, and it just, it ruins the bunch. And how do you feel that we get trust back in our agencies and, um, and, and get the people to really respect, to respect it? Do you know what I mean? Cause I just, I feel like sure. we're just at really, in general, law enforcement across the board. I mean, it's 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 taking a hit right now, which I think is just horrible and ridiculous. And and by the way, I hate to be going public and 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 you know voicing my opinions on these topics, but we need police and we need mm -hmm. FBI. And but how do how do you feel we can get some of these uh, things back that have been lost? I, uh, 
one is that it's it's one agent, one police officer at a time interacting people. That's that's on a simple level, uh, right. treating everybody with respect. Um, and then at the FBI level, you know, there needs to be some checks and balances. When you get these little power groups together, that's when things can run into problems. And, yeah. and I I had mentioned early on to people when the iner- initial you know kind of in this this Russia. Uh, you know, type narrative is that it was all run out of FBI headquarters, and then you kind of have a, you know, you're it's kind of an echo chamber, and where yeah. usually usually in the FBI, work is done at the field, local field office, not at headquarters, and you know, headquarters certainly has expertise and oversight and get your resources, but that is usually a more you know recipe for success and for reality. Um, so, so, you know, I, I try to let people know, you know, that there are some bad people, like you just said. Yep. Uh, in fact, the second day at the academy, they they lectured us on that. They said, look, look around. We are human. You know, we're we're the FBI. We try to have a rigorous background investigation. We try to pick the best and the brightest. But guess what? You know, things are going to happen. And they would go through some things that happened within the FBI and then FBI agents. And, and, you know, they, they just said, don't, and, you know, it's kind of the slippery slope um, ethics talk. And so I try to let people know, you know, it, it's kind of cliche, but, you know, most agents are good. Some are bad. In this case, you know, history is going to judge it. But, uh, and, and then go into law enforcement. I've put law enforcement officers in jail. I've worked various cases. Um, you know, those are not fun to do as a law enforcement officer, but, you know, we, we have to not, um, you know, have our head in the sand. We have to deal with anything internal affairs or, or the like. But that said, we can't let it paralyze law enforcement to actually, uh, you know, providing the both, you know, the, the peacemaking and the law enforcement piece of the policing. So it's, sure. it's you know, it's a combo. So it, it, it's right. A, Right. It's a difficult question. Yeah, it but, is. And uh, that's why I asked it, because, I, you know, I, I knew you'd have a very eloquent answer. And and I think for those people listening, I mean, I, I think that's a great answer. And in fact, what, what's kind of interesting in preparation for this interview, I, I saw this thing was the I think it was called the FBI files. It was on cable TV the other night. And just by by mere chance, it was just on TV when I turned it on. And it was a story about um, these 10 Russian um, spies that had come into the United States. And you might remember this a few years ago, but it was under uh, Podesta, I think. And um, well, anyway, they interviewed all the FBI agents that were involved in trying to find these spies and, and infiltrate the network and find out how many there were and what they were doing and what kind of information they were getting. And it was it was really fascinating but one of the things that really struck me, and I never really thought of it, like this woman who was one of the agents that would monitor the fa- one of the families, because these were just families. They were li- living in a neighborhood just like mine, just like yours, next door neighbors, waved to them every morning. Um, but she says, through the process, I spent more time with their kids than they did, than her own. Can you imagine? She goes, I spent more time monitoring that family and their kids than my own. And she goes, I fell in love with them. I fell in love with this family that I was that I was having to surveil. And she goes, when we had to take them down, she goes, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life because I genuinely cared for these people. Sure. Wasn't that amazing? And they were Russian spies. And so, so you hear those things and you're right. At the end of the day, these are all. I mean, you know, you're, the FBI is a people business and security as we're going to kind of segue to that, is also somewhat of a people business, isn't it? It is. Yeah, um, when you think about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it's really it's about communicating with employees, um, with experts, um, right. with, with the business, people with business acumen, because it still has to be done with, with an eye to business. It just, you, you can't have all or nothing. Right. To figure out, you know, and that, that's probably one of the hardest things within the cybersecurity business. Uh, yeah, it, it is to treat it as a business for the company. Um, so it, it's really challenging, and, and and then you also have your attackers, and who who are they, and why yeah, are who they, are they? To get in. right, right, so and then also people talk. 
So th there's all the human elements come into this at multiple levels, and it's fascinating. So when we think of your experience and, you know, what I've known in, in working with you and, and I guess what I love and respect and admire about you um, in what you do in your craft, you know, you're, you're an expert in cybersecurity. You understand, as we were talking earlier, the forensics, that deep dive in finding mm -hmm. stuff. Right. And then really that internal investigation. So, you know, you hear so much about consulting firms and all the things they're doing around security. And, you know, what has really, I think, differentiated you from anything I've seen is that you really come at it with this kind of almost an FBI methodology, right? It's around the people. It's around the what are the tools that the bad guys would use. But more importantly, why are they using them? What are they really trying to get? Who are the people they're going to try to pinch? Um, and then how do you investigate if there's something internal and how do you find that? And so, and I'm going to kind of segue into Larson Security, but that's kind of what Larson Security is. I mean, may, maybe you can tell our, our listeners about the company that you founded and why on earth you would leave a many decade career in fighting cyber criminals um, with FBI into your own gig. Cause that's, that's gotta be a, a big transition, isn't it? Leaving, sure. Sure. leaving the agency and, and coming into your own business. Oh yeah. And you know, definitely left the safety net uh, of government and uh, you know, all the benefits that came with it. The FBI pays very well, but the beauty of my business is I still get to do a lot of the investigations and computer forensics and data analytics on the cutting edge like I did in the FBI. Um, right. And in, and in some instances, I almost get more access because a lot of companies are very fearful in letting the FBI or the government uh, into what they were doing, uh, their trade secrets, and just overall uh, internal politics of it all. There's a lot of internal politics in business and in when an incident happens. And so going back to the human element, I deal with that as well, where, where the FBI usually comes in as an outsider and they either ask for it by consent or we have a search warrant or court order. And so sometimes I actually bridge that gap. So it might be the company gets called by the FBI and then I get called by the company. Hey, this incident's going on. We need to figure out what's going on. And then right. I can also speak the language. I can read the tea leaves of what's going on. I can help ensure that the company keeps operating, nothing's disrupted, and that also they, their various risk, um, uh, kind of their their risk uh, strategy. Um, you know, we, we go through all those different elements of of where they have risk, um, whether it's compliance risk, uh, do they have an employee internal issue, is it from the outside, what is this? Um, sure, and sure. Really that's what, and I can take it from both the technical side and the cyber side um, and the analytics. And, and I really like the forensic component of what we know because we can go in and independently verify where the data is the data. So you, you often go into a situation where an IT staff might be naturally defensive because they don't want to be the ones that let this happen. They don't want to be held responsible. So sure, they might, sure. They, they might sugarcoat it a little bit or, yeah, right. uh, you know, um, so we've come in and, and we both look at the facts and the stories and we kind of put it all together. And, and to me, that is very, you know, that's what I've been doing for 25 years and I really enjoy it. And so does our team. Yeah. And, and you've got a heck of a team. you want to talk to people a little bit about who you've assembled? Because I think what you've kind of done is, is you've said, you know, I'm going to go out to the people I've worked with in my career and I'm going to go find the best that I work with and kind of cherry pick them and, and bring them into the fold. But, you know, you've just assembled an amazing team. If you can talk about them a little bit. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I pretty much um, include or, you know, as part of our team, former FBI agents, uh, military, uh, usually military intelligence type uh, officers or the law enforcement officers like uh, uh, Office of Special in uh, Office of Special Investigations for the Air Force, or Air Force OSI. They were known, uh, along with the FBI, as kind of being on the cutting edge of, of the cyberspace and the cyber uh, crime and cyber warfare. Uh, and I worked with them back in my FBI days. And 
be, and different from the FBI, where in the Air Force, those guys, they are the, the they're the Air Force system, so they get a lot of hands-on training of all these intrusions. Um, yeah. So that, that's how they kind of cut their, but they didn't really have the civilian piece, the business side, and all the kind of the different civil and criminal statutes that the FBI got trained on and had a lot of experience. So we're a good team in that way. And also former law enforcement, NYPD. Uh, and then we, we always try to get some young techies involved. So oh, it, yeah. it, takes, it takes a team. So it doesn't. It really mean, does. That's right. You know, so, so and, and part of it, at, at times, I sometimes liken it to being, uh, you know, that we'll bring in a particular talent because you don't have always that talent on staff. It's kind of like a, a high-end general contractor who's building a, 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 you know, a very nice home. And all of a sudden you need to put in, you know, you know, X, Y, or Z in a room, you get that expert and then you might need them for a little bit and that's what you do. And so that's really, that's our philosophy. We just don't, uh, you know, try to hammer in uh, square pegs into a round, round hole. We try to have light, highly trained teams that are kind of special forces like that can go and attack a problem. Well, that's really interesting. And now, and I know that you work with many different industries, so you're, you're not like in one vertical market. I mean, I know you've done work with very large med tech companies in this town and um, one specifically in Rochester. And um, I know you've you've done a lot with uh, uh, banks, you know, large banks. Um, but what what are some other, I mean, what would a typical engagement with you look like? I mean, if I'm, you know, if I'm a company listening to this right now and, you know, I've just been breached or something happened or I'm kind of thinking something is going on internal, um, what what would a, an engagement look like if we were to use you? Yeah, well, you know, we set up a, a quick engagement um, and we, we come in and we assess the situation. So it can be going right to a a known hacked server or laptop, and then we forensically preserve it, we image it, and then we analyze it. Uh, we might w look at logs or grab other logs or make sure maybe there's something not configured right or not recording properly. We'll make that adjustment in that kind of situation. Now that's an incident response. It might be, sure. it, it might be somebody who is, is in the medical and they, they're getting HIPAA um, you know, requests or they, they might have some kind of data disclosure issue uh, or some other contracting with a vendor where, where a big a contractor like a United Healthcare, for example, has a huge vendor, uh, you know, the whole v vendor supply chain. So we might come into companies and then assess them and say, yes, this company is following best practices and here's what we did to prove that for you. So it's a combination of incident response, prevention, and then sometimes in these incident responses, when it morphs to something like ransomware, uh, you have recovery. You might have to pay a, an attacker and go through that scenario with Bitcoin. So it, it takes a lot, of, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge to pivot in these different cases and figure out what exactly a client needs, and we bring that kind of expertise uh, you know, kind of, kind of like a, kind of like, you know, medical specialists, you know, we, we can dig right. and dive into different things. Well, so, so you kind of talked, uh, touched on a couple, you know, comments about technology. And, and so, you know, for somebody who's listening here today, you kind of have seen it all. I mean, what would you really, if you were to say, what are the top three security challenges that you see right now and what are some emerging technologies um and hopefully you name drop me um, but oh, what yeah. are yeah. what are some what are some emerging technologies that you see that you think are really going to make an impact as we move into kind of the new world of artificial intelligence and you're starting to see how hackers are using that technology you're seeing you know uh high performance computing and even quantum computing now um, what are what do you see as on the horizon as the things that as companies really need to start thinking about? What are the risks? Okay, okay, I'll, I'll start with the beginning and kind of what are we seeing on, you know, where, where's where where are those you know threats and risks? Um, number one, it, it, it's still Office 365. Um, yeah. People need to understand their environment. So a lot of companies, and especially with with the pandemic going on, have migrated even more to Office 365. 
Now, th there are configurations and things to really concern yourself with with 365 because the the bad guys, for lack of a better term, know how to try and attack your domain of your company, you know, abc.com, yep. and go after it and, and try to try to hack it. So you need your multi-factor authentication or, or your two-step, however you want to describe it. And, and you got to do some of those basic things. And so, so kind of like Eddie Sutton is, is known for saying, why do you rob banks in the twenties? Well, that's where the money is. Well, for a lot of <laughs> yeah, hackers, right. the email and the, and the files is where the information is for wh whether it's, it's credit card fraud, intellectual property type frauds, or encrypting it for ransomware. Um, you know, to, to, to get, to, to get that payment to decrypt it. Um, now what, what's in, what's important on, on, on that also kind of delves to the cloud environment. So Office 365, obviously cloud, and then you have your other environments in the cloud. And I think that's where it comes into, uh, knowing, securing your environment and then also the good uh, you know, encryption, protecting your environment. So, so Scott, Scott, I mean, I, since you brought up the cloud and we all know the cloud is about centralization, right? So we're, we're just creating massive data hotels around the cloud, which is centralized, right? Yep. It, it, would it be fair to say, and I, and I guess this is where I grapple with as somebody that's developing the next generation security, decentralization is is clearly the future there's there's no doubt about it the decentralized cloud i think is is going to be where we're going to end up and where it's going to be really secure and again you know that's the approach we've taken with our security but because centralization has major risks but a lot of people think they've been kind of sold a bill of goods that you know if we move everything to the cloud we're secure and that's just not the case right no, i mean no, no and not. and and i think that that's something that people need to understand so what are you what are you telling people that are starting to put everything into that bucket? Um, well, well, I, I stay partially with the human element side. You still have to right. have your processes. Um, you know, you got to update your policies, procedures, kind of the boring stuff. But it's really you can't just flip a switch. You're going to have other things that you have to know and learn and get through the process. You also need some control. And that's what I like, something like Secure 2. You have right. that control. You know? Right. Um, and and that's, the, that's the balance that you get with, with the cloud. Um, so that's um, Amazon in particular. I mean, most of Amazon is just providing the infrastructure. Right. right. They've certainly right. added on more things. But the risk is really with the tenant. It's with the company. Um, yeah, that's true. You know. You know, and then also Microsoft, you know, has their own operate, you know, all the agreements and the like and the legal pieces of it. So there's the legal piece of it, the human element, and then what can you control and protect? And I think that's where you're going to see the control and protect is, is where the future is going to be on making the, the kind of the hybrid world of cloud and what you have local premise or even at just the laptop, you know, host. That is sure. More right. Possibly just, you know, dispersed from from large uh, office buildings if that happens, you know. Um, well, so so one, one thing that has struck me as kind of interesting, you know, when you start talking about the cloud, because, you know, we're, we're doing a lot with the cloud, and, you know, the cloud has scale, the cloud has capability, the cloud can, can really um, handle the complexity that a lot of people used to have to manage, which, you know, really – it's pushing the complexity onto somebody else basically in, in kind of a shared tenancy environment. Um, but one of the things that has struck me is, you know, we kind of looked at, you know, how do we protect the cloud is just this whole idea of putting you under the control of the security and then also making sure that your stuff's not just sitting in, in one spot. But what we're really doing, if you think about it is you're, we're pushing all that risk into that end user uh, or to that endpoint. And how do you, tell customers to, to how do you manage that endpoint um, when you ultimately have to trust somebody, right? And, and maybe this is where the human element comes into play and in really identifying who has access to what, how long they can access it, where they can access it. Um, how do you view that? Because, you know, I, I feel like 
we now with at least technologies like Secure 2, we can protect the cloud. But how do you how do you handle that that endpoint element? Because I know that's where you spend a lot of your time, right? I mean, a lot of what you do happens on that endpoint. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it comes down to configuration and also how you protect it. Um, and so what we do is we usually go in. So a lot of companies will will scan networks, do assessments. One of the things we do, and this kind of goes to our forensic knowledge and more, our more in-depth knowledge of advanced persistent threat, you know, our, our teams can reverse engineer, you know, custom malware that Symantec and Trend Micro don't know about. Um, and, and maybe the FBI and CIA and NSA haven't seen. You know, it's new stuff. It's morphing. It's always changing. Sure. Um, so we want to get to that desktop because that desktop hard drive on that laptop might have, you know, that might be the entry point or that might be, you know, have some really good code. So, we, so we, we go in and we forensically image, even in an assessment, a few of these laptops just to see what is normal. So as we're looking at everything, we want to see what is normal, what is not normal. Um, right. And, and, and that can go multiple levels. One is, is, is it configured to best standards, uh, what software is on there. Can the local user put on software that is hasn't been uh, tested or, or it, it creates a weakness for the environment? Um, all sorts of pieces like that. And then we're going to see what kind of encryptions on it. If that laptop locks, what kind of yeah. uh, you know what kind of risk does that company have? So there's all kinds of pieces we look at that endpoint, and often that endpoint is hard uh, for a company to manage. They can handle the servers. They can even handle, you know, the laptop in the office, but as they start going home, that gets a little more difficult to manage. So we really try to get out there and inspect those devices. Interesting, interesting. So, so now as we look at where the hackers are spending their time right now, is there a vertical market that I guess what are they what are they going after? I mean, is it really just getting data or doing ransomware or? getting you to pay money? I mean, what are you seeing as really the big driver for the hacks that we see that are just going on? And, and what are they doing with this data? And I, I guess just, you know, what what is the market look like right now? And, and why is there such a frequency and so much hacking going on? Sure. Um, the, the, the focus is, is on the financials. Uh, and and that, is, that is varied, and I'll get into that. Also, the healthcare world, because there's a lot of information in a in someone's um, you know health electric electronic health record. Sure. Um, so, and those are worth more. Somebody was just to sell them. That's worth worth more than just a credit card. So but what does somebody do? What does a hacker do with that information? So, like you know, if I let's say I'm just I'm a bad actor from a um, you know foreign nation state. I broke into you know one of the medical companies here in town. I just took you know, all their customer and patient information from them. What are they going to do with it? Uh, I mean, what, what, yeah, there, there's a lot of information there. There's, there's addresses, personal information, uh, relatives, um, you know, you name it in a, in a health record. It is just a treasure trove of information that then can be used to target you, your business and so on. So, by the way, I knew the answer to that. I just had to have you answer it. <laughs> yep. and, and, and there's multiple pieces to it. It, it depends right. what their first goal is. It's, it's, it's almost like they, they have that record and then they can use different pieces of it. You know what I mean? It has a shelf life. Right. Um, so I, I can try to do a, 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 you know, a, a tax return type fraud um, if I can get into your payroll, for example, or right. you know, your credit card. I, I can – you know, do, do all sorts of things. And I might do that first before I then go grab your credit cards and do that other fraud, you know, because you're going to get alerted right away with a credit card. The other stuff takes some time. You're not going to know if, if somebody put in, put in a fake tax return in your name, you're not going to know until you follow your tax return. They do it early and they try to get the money and run. So yeah. um, those are all things uh, that, you know, on some of the financial things and then the healthcare and then you have intellectual property. And then I would put all of those then could be subject to a ransomware. So ransomware is a little more automatic or they try to burrow in with some sort of malware and, and start going to town. 
and it, it depends on what group has hit you with when it comes to ransomware. Um, and so, they just want an extortion a payment. Right. So now, so if I'm a, if I'm a customer today and I've, I've, I'm a victim of a crime like this and, and believe it or not, there's some companies and I know one of them and I, I'm not going to mention their name, but, um, they had a, uh, email came in to somebody in their accounting department from the CEO who it wasn't the CEO, but it was his email that said, uh, pay this bill. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I'll pay it. And they paid it. It was like 170 some thousand dollars gone. And they did it several times. And so it ends up being a very big number and they did not go to the authorities, which I thought was really surprising. And I think part of it is because, um, you know, publicly traded company, they didn't want to get it out into the wild that this had happened. And I just happened to, you know, know one of the you know high ranking people in the company and they were, you know, at least nice enough to tell me that it happened. And they said, what should we do? And, but you know, what should a company, I mean, if this happens to a company and they're listening today, what are the steps they have to take to um, report it or not report it? Or do they just call you on the hotline immediately? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what... yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. What you're talking about, kind of the, ter- the current vernacular is business email compromise. So somebody right. sends an email and, and is, it's, a, it's a spear phishing or, you know, it's constructed so you think, I'm getting an email from Darren. Darren is saying all the right things. Pay this, right? And, and right. I have the authority, and I go do it. Um, you know, definitely get on the horn with, you know, to try to stop the wire transfer. Okay, and and I do think I would I would recommend either you call law law enforcement or you call me or both. Um, right. Because because there's multiple reasons for that. One is there might be a, a cyber crime policy. That needs to get kicked in, you know. If it's a large amount, if it hits the threshold, that that company will get reimbursed for both my services and for any potential loss. But also, when a wire ha- wire transfer is executed, it's gone. So it's really up to that trail of banks to then give it back before it gets to the end bad guy. So right. there's all kinds of things for the reason for some speed, and often a call on on you know, that I can help and say, well, you need to do these steps right away. And then we go from there and then we figure out how to stop it going forward. Um, Well, that's, that's great. That's great advice. And um, now I know you and I both wear tinfoil hats um, just because we're in this industry, (laughs) but um, what keeps you up at night? You know, I know we've been talking here about some of these threats that are happening today that are very real and, and costing our local companies here millions of dollars. Like what? What worries you the most right now? What are what are trends that you're seeing that are frightening? Because um, you know I've got a couple that are really bothering me right now, and and uh, and I think you know people need to find out about them. But what keeps you up at night? I mean, I think the Internet of Things, uh, because it's, yeah. it's so new and so novel and and relatively cheap to do little onesies and twosies on it, um, where it's not really secure or known. So. So in addition to the, um, you know, to the world of credit card fraud and ransomware, there's also doxing where people might publish and embarrass whoever their enemies are. Um, right. And, and I see that as a potential problem, uh, but also that's a gateway into your network. So depending yes, it on how is. those are set up, you know, then that's a hot, you know, you've let somebody in your network that then can get to your your laptop, your servers, your other uh, key data, you know, processing elements, and that can be a huge that 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 bothers me. Um, yeah. Also, the you know, kind of the whole nation state anarchy world, um, you know, and just being in my FBI background, I just worry about some of the public safety systems potentially getting taken down or compromised. And, and by being compromised, I just mean they can be affected negatively so oh, not sure. necessarily taken down fully but somehow you know really causing a problem um well and, look and at what happened last week you remember the nine was it nine one one went down sure um i mean that was that was scary you know oh, very, yeah very scary in, in fact um i used to brief a case that was up in massachusetts where a hacker took down a nine one one network 
Um, oh, really? And, and, he, and he, wow. he, hacked, he hacked one of the phone switches. And S the phone runs on SS7, which is their operating system. Um, and he learned how to hack this particular switch. And he brought down the 911 system. So, uh, wow. you know, New, New York in the East Coast had some power outages. It was rumored. It was various things. So those are some of the things you know, kind of on, on that scale, but I'm more worried about public safety, the health systems, you know, yeah, stuff that I agree. can impact every, everybody. Um, yeah. And things you, know, you take for granted, right? I mean, like we, we have these systems now and we're just so used to having them available. What happens when they go down, right? I mean, you become so reliant on these things and you just don't even realize it. It's, it is frightening. Right. Um, you know, one, one that really scared me the most. And in fact, I know a gentleman who worked in in security and for uh, one of the large power companies, and but it's protecting the power grid. Now most people don't know there's a huge fight about um, to keep the power grid, you know, these nuclear reactors offline, meaning not connected to the internet and more on older private systems that are in their own private networks. But then there's a push now to you know connect them to the internet. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I know sense. how insecure the internet is, and it really bothers me that we may be putting our power systems on there. What do you, what's your thought around that? Yeah, I like it wherever we can have physical systems and physical backup systems. Yeah, that, that's the way to go. Um, just because I, I totally understand the connectivity and the benefits it can have, but then you need separate systems. There's always been a push to have a high and low system, you know, kind of a internet, you know public system and then your private network um it, it but it, how it's okay now let, let's talk about private network how private really is a network because you know you hear these larger companies that can buy up dark fiber and they say oh you know i've got my own private dark fiber network running between my locations and um well you can still hack it i mean you can still do packet sniffing you can still i mean there's a lot of stuff a hacker can do across networks it's just fiber optic right right so, I mean, is that really that much more secure? I don't think so. Well, it, it, yes and no. Maybe. Uh, it, 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 it's harder to tap. I mean, not, that's true. This is a much longer conversation. Yeah, um, right. But, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of both. And it, it's um, most. I suppose you block have, out the everyday of, hacker. Right. 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 And, and, you, you might get benefits in that kind of dark fiber where you're going, you know, campus to campus. Uh, but is it really separated? How do you know? Uh, there's all kinds of things that go in with that, with both the physical layer and how you, you have the whole network set up. Um, so generally, there isn't the clean kind of, you know, high and low or private and public. It's usually... There's usually some commingling, and and I've even seen it where people just plug court, uh, you know, um, um, Cat Five and Cat Six into the wrong jack, and all of a sudden they just, you know, their private network is now out on the internet, and it was just a mistake in a closet. Um, oh, geez. so there's all kinds of there's all yeah. kinds of pieces to that. So yeah, yeah. Um, but this is part know, of a strategy, right? I mean, that's part of what you would come in and help a company you know, figure out and understand and, and look at what the risks are and, and give them a kind of a scorecard, so to speak, of, you know, here, here's here's your weak points and here's what you need to think about. I mean, is that kind of kind of what you would do? Yep, exactly. Yeah. And, and think about it. That's just a very physical human piece to that data center. You right. You have these together and also have these marked very nice yeah. and then inspect them from time to time. You know? Right, right, um, right. So get into the weeds there yeah oh god let me tell you you and i could we could probably talk on this for several hours and go down so many different roads but but i think this was really a, a great start and you know i think we have to do this again because i think there's a lot more that we could be talking about but i i really wanted to get people to know you know about you what you do and what you do that is so important and um and i just really want to thank you for all your time today this was really a great discussion and, and i think anybody who was listening today you know, knows there's good people out there and, and, and knows that, uh, there's, you know, some, I, I think some champions around privacy and protection and protecting our companies that, 
um, you get you just do such a great job at doing. And so I guess I'll I'll, I'll end on one last question because I just this is one I gotta you know uh, ask you. Um, of all of the things that you've done in your career for customers, what's the one thing that you're the most proud about doing? The most Boy, I'm putting you on. Doing, I'm putting you on you, the spot here. You you are putting me on the spot. Um, probably the most proud. There there's other things I can not talk about, but it's exonerating somebody who they thought was a bad guy, but was. You know, it, it just is by, you know, by circumstance, um, they had the wrong person in exonerating them. So, again, it comes to yeah, a Yeah, that's got to feel so good. And yeah. so, like, you know, you because you often come in and you kind of have this suspect or subject. And you think, right, it. right. And, and, and this person, you know, exonerating them. And you're coming in because you're looking at the data. You're not really – you have the human elements, right? And you have interviews. But it's really – exonerating them um that that was really a nice kind of the human touch yeah so no i i could see how that could just feel so so great and you know uh helping somebody get off of something that they're being accused of that's just that's got to really feel good you know um well, anyway, well, we are going to leave on that note, but Scott Larson, thank you so much. And again, for all those listening, uh, check out Larson's security, uh, Scott Larson, one of the best in the biz. And we're so blessed that there's guys like you out there. So thank you so much for what you do, Scott. Darren, thank you very much. And again, it's always a pleasure to work with you and use your stuff. And, uh, I, I would well, also want to say, you know, people need to, I mean, th- there are, there are, there are products out there and there are solutions and then there are novel solutions and I think you're the latter. So thank you so much. Well, you know, you, I'll tell you what, I remember when you went through all this stuff and tried to break it <laughs> and then brought me to some guys that gave me a report that blew my mind away over in, out in DC. And, um, you know, I just realized just how, how good you guys are at what you do. Cause you know, a lot of times when you have people review your stuff, you just get, you know, uh, it worked or didn't work. I mean, to get the detail analysis that I just didn't even know was you guys had the capability was blew my mind. So, so you guys are the real deal. So, well, thank you so much. We're going to definitely do this again and, uh, and have a wonderful day. We'll talk to you soon. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye.